The War is Over, the Stonehouse Series, Chapter 43. In the spirit arena, Jesus' personal guardian, Uriah, was dealing with Malbec's preparations as the troop approached Jerusalem. Malbec, sir, rehearse for me. Stipulations required to be met prior to an angel's interference with a human action. Do you mean the duly granted authorization permitting me to cut a human in half from the top of his head to his, uh, his miscellaneous parts? If you are referring to the same request and granting sequence for stepping through the waters and cutting off a finger, then yes. Sir, no authorization is ever required to reduce any demon into a disconfitted pile of sizzling entrails in the dirt. Dispatching demons from planet Earth is a part of any angel's standing orders. Malbec, are you avoiding the question? Malbec, you just can't directly damage a human in the process. The demon must be pushed away from or released by their human host first. Hmm. At least a little bit away, yes, of course. Authorized deliverance through the host's inferred request. Three years ago, Jesus maneuvered me space to um, do my chores in this place where we are going, the Jerusalem temple. I expect him to do the same today, soon. Early morning dew kept the dust down on their walk to town, and Jesus was hungry. He had skipped breakfast again. Together, 13 men approached the city's massive outer walls, while in the distance, Jerusalem's temple came into view through the open gates. Close to where they were walking, Jesus observed an item slightly out of place. Pre-seasoned leaves on a lone fig tree. Although they were past the time of any freezing weather, winter was not quite gone and summer had not yet arrived. Fig tree, why do you have leaves? What are you telling me? That you have fruit? Huh. Fig tree, you never have leaves until your first fruits are ripe. And I am rather hungry. What do you have for me? Veering right, he dropped slightly down, leaving the gravel road and then up an embankment, his mouth salivating by the time he reached the tree. John called out from the others, waiting at the road. Hannah's breakfast was better than anything you'll find on that tree. Reaching the fig tree with his back towards the twelve, he gave John no answer, but rather began looking for his breakfast, hiding behind the leaves. Where are you? John continued on. Biscuits in the chicken gravy, toasted bread with honey butter, or just toast with butter and a little jam. Jesus' stomach rumbled his response while he worked his way around the empty tree. This is so wrong. Telling people you have figs, when in fact you have none. Hot herb tea and some of those eggs in a hole things you like to make, Martha must have taught her how to do it. They were almost as good as yours. The eyes of all twelve were focused on their teacher now, searching out an empty tree. He was on the far side and facing them, moving back and looking up higher in the tree. Anything? Not one fig. Somewhat dejected, Jesus let his gaze slowly fall, scanning through the leaves and branches one last time. Nothing. Ugh. Standing 20 feet before him was the barren tree, 
His twelve were slightly lower to his left. Directly in line with the tree trunk and through the city gates was the temple, majestically displayed in the distance. There's no food in you either. Not anymore. And Jesus raised his right hand and pointed at the tree and the temple and said, No man eat fruit from you from hereafter and forever. The twelve fell back several steps, stumbling almost to the ground, struggling, and at first to recover, John caught his balance. Firmly planting both his feet, he vigorously shook his right hand up and down, laughing with animated surprise displayed on his face. Well, uh, kind of close there, Jesus. Watch where you point that thing. I'm glad you didn't burn a hole through me with your eyes. I thought you might have smoked me for a minute there, but I do pity that poor fig tree. You're not the problem, John. It's the perverted philosophies of men. No one standing there saw a thing. They were just looking at a tree, but Jesus watched as the presence of his father prepared to leave that temple made of stone. The old temple order was now in flux. The transition was in motion. The old covenant had brought him to this place, but the new covenant would be cut in him. Continuing their walk to the temple, with the steady stream of people arriving for the coming seven days of Passover, John moved over to walk next to Jesus. I have the food bag today, John said, lifting the cover off his shoulder bag. Hannah and Esther packed it for us last night. Jesus looked inside. There were small cloth wrapped bundles, red ones and tan. The tan colored ones are bread and goat cheese and the small red ones are dried fruit, dates, with raisins, apple chips, and roasted nuts, a very tasty mixture. Jesus' right hand reached into the bag and took out a folded red bundle. Thank you. Esther asked that we would return the cloth napkins if we could. Yes, of course, said Jesus as he removed the tie string around it and unfolded the bundle, holding it in his left hand. He tried a dried apple chip. It was creamy white with no peel and as light as a goose down feather. It snapped when he bit in it. Mmm, that's good. Who makes them? Esther said Hannah does the dried fruit. The apples and pears are her specialty. I understand she uses several different kinds of apples, some with the skin on and some peeled. I like the chewy ones with the bright green peel. They have a bit of twang to them. The raisins had a dusting of saltiness added to them, and Jesus picked out several of those and ate them, licking his fingers. And next he chose an apple chip with a bright green peel, placed it on the center of his tongue, and closed his mouth. Slowly, his cheeks sort of sucked in and he closed his eyes. He shifted the apple bite around in his mouth and chomped down on it. He, he shook his head like a wet dog, but continued chewing the chip until he swallowed and opened his eyes. Good, huh? That will wake up your mouth. Jesus reached into the food pack and pulled out two more of the red wrapped bundles. Wow, they do have a bit of zip in them, don't they? He stated as he deposited one in each of his two outer round pockets. John watched the trail mix bundles disappear into Jesus's pockets and noticed the odd braided leather belt double wrapped around his inner robe. He had seen that braided leather before. Today they entered the court of the Gentiles through a ground-level gate and emerged 
into a throng of people. Master, said John, there must be 25 or 30,000 people here today, and it's still early in the morning. They made their way through the sea of people moving towards the temple gate. Looking above the massive doorway, John could make out the broken anchor holes where Herod's Roman eagle had been mounted. The eagle was gone, but the scars remained. Off to the right side of the stone entry was Emil. There were two men near him with bandages around their heads. One bandage covered a left ear and eye, and the other covered a right ear and eye. The bandages were days old and dirty. The men were listening to Emil, who spoke to them. Following Jesus, John and the others moved towards Emil. John noticed red puffiness protruding from under the bandages, and there was a green tinge soaking through each bottom edge of the dirty cloth. In an involuntary motion, John covered his nose with his sleeve, protecting himself from the eye-watering stench emanating from the men. As Jesus drew close, both would-be assassins painfully lowered themselves to their knees before him. They spoke together, Master, please forgive us for our wickedness that we meant to do to Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. We were so very wrong. Placing a hand on each head and reading the fevers of well over 100 degrees, Jesus answered, saying, Yes, I forgive you. Sin no more. When you see that little scrapper of a girl, please tell her or them that we will do what we can to protect them. The others added hesitantly, not, not that they need help. She did just fine on her own. Jesus was grinning with one eyebrow raised as he answered, She wasn't alone, but you will look at them with your own eyes and hear with your own ears. Their forgiveness to you, as you tell them of your faithfulness, which is now set towards them. Both men were still on their knees. Jesus' hands on their heads, each looking up through one good eye, green pus oozing out of swollen, infected wounds, both covered with the stink of a certain death, and flies buzzed around their heads. Yes, sir, they answered. And in that instance of forgiveness and repentance, both men pulled on the life resident in Jesus to flow into them. His goodness came like cool honey on their heads, not just covering, but flowing in, as if each man were a giant sponge and the life of God saturated each cell of their bodies. With a visible line starting at the top of each head and flowing down, each body hair stood straight out, hovered, and then lay flat. <laughs> as the power of God flowed through them, purifying every particle of their physical selves. As that line of his purifying presence passed down from their ankles to the bottom of their feet, both men shivered violently for a fraction of a second, as if an icy backdraft wind burst across sweaty, damp skin. Jesus peeled the crusty green bandages off of their heads, and even though the stink of infection stayed with the bandages in his hands, the skin beneath was totally mended. Only gentle scars remained as a memory of their encounter with a woman's purse. In the spirit arena, Malbec was cleaning his sword to a background sound of like bacon sizzling in a pan. Get ready, Uriah. 
He is about to kick in the door.